So I got a message uh, asking about this clotting process that I had written. Um, so they just said, hi, I was wondering if you had a video and the Word document for this part of the clotting process. Uh, I basically don't. I made this clotting process myself. Uh, this slide you can find, so she was, when she asked me this question, it was a reference to when I put out the Instagram and Facebook pros, uh, clots and no clot medicines, uh, anti plaintlets and anticoagulants made easy. I think this was one of the last slides that was in it. Uh, but I actually put out this uh, clotting process uh, a while back before that even uh, and this was um, done and I wrote this about it when I first put it out uh, so a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that works. So that's what I was trying to do here when I first put out to this clotting process a number of years ago. So right, the blood clotting process is a complex system. As you can basically see from this whole chart, it does look quite complex. Yet a child can explain it so simply. Fall over, scrape knee, and a scab is formed. Of course, there are a number of different clotting factors, receptors, and enzymes in play when the blood clots, but who can remember them all and the purpose they play? In this picture, we show a simple clotting process in relation to anticoagulants and antiplatelets. So the idea when I first wrote this was you can simplify the process that you need to learn when you put it in relations to the medicines that affect the clotting process. So they're your antiplatelets and your antioagulants. And then, so this will hopefully give you a frame of reference and something to associate the cloning processes. So it's very easy to forget all these individual pathways and stuff if you don't have uh, essentially an endpoint of where you're trying to get to. So if you remember where all the medicines work, um, and you eventually do need to learn where all the medicines work for your university degree and your uh, exams, um, your intern exams, then it kind of makes it easier to remember the overall pathway. So I'll just go into a more detailed breakdown about this in this video. So let's start by defining a few of the key words. So a uh, blood clot is a thrombus um, and that is made up of both platelets and fibrin. So essentially uh, there are more stuff that make up the blood clot, but they're the make up the bulk of it. So platelets and fibrin. So platelets are a type of blood cells that form clumps that add to the mass of the thrombus. Um, so they form the platelet aggregation. Um, and then that platelet aggregation forms a platelet plug, but this isn't like super stable. So then fibrin is then uh, formed. So fibrin is a protein that forms a mesh that traps the red blood cells. This is formed via the coagulation cascade, which happens after the initial platelet aggregation. So after the platelet aggregation, uh, the coag coagulation cascade begins, and then we make fibrin. So the fibrin strand form of the platelet plug, um, or may form a fibrin clot. So we go back to the initial uh, clotting process here. So I broke it up into two separate bits here, basically. So this top half here, this top half here is the platelet aggregation bit. Uh, and then, so here we're just trying to form this platelet plug. And then after this platelet plug is formed, we can activate the coagulation um, cascade, which is this bit here, in order so we can form fibrin. Uh, so here's when we're forming fibrin to make a, on, with this platelet aggregation plug um, in order to form like a more stronger clot. So in its simple process or a simple system, um, a platelet plus a fibrin equals a stable clot. Um, and this does not fall apart. So that is uh, essentially the clotting process in a very simplified form. So platelet plus ribbon equals stable clot. And we have two different uh, processes that basically do that. So the first process was this one. So here we're talking about the platelet aggregation process. Uh, and then we can look at where the different medicines work on here in order to help remember this actual process. So here in this clotting process ch um, chart that I've made, uh, I've denoted where medicines work by putting the symbols here. So these are the tablet symbols. And then the red symbol means that they are inhibiting this area. So aspirin, so I've taken the mechanisms from the AMH. So inhibits platelet aggregation. So it's inhibiting this aggregation by irreversibly binding to uh, the COX. Um, so it's irreversibly binding the COX, reducing the synthesis of thromboxin A2. So when we inhibit COX, uh, we then therefore inhibit TXA2. Um, 
And then when we inhibit those, then obviously we can't get platelet aggregation. Uh, so other medicines that work here also, your P2Y12 antagonists. Um, so these are the medicines here. So the active metabolite of these irreversibly bind to the platelet P2Y12 receptors. Um, so they're irreversibly binding to this receptor here, the P2Y12 receptors, um, for the and inhibit the platelet aggregation for the light of the platelet. Uh, so when we when we bind to here, we inhibit P2Y12. Um, and then therefore we can't make platelet aggregation as well. So this is the one mechanism on how the, uh, our antiplatelet medicines basically stop the formation of a clot because we're for stopping the formation of platelet aggregation. And then we have our glycoprotein uh, receptors. So here um, they prevent, uh, prevent binding of fibrogen to platelets by occupying their glycoprotein receptors, thereby blocking platelet aggregation. So here they occupy this here, this receptor, the glycoprotein receptor, and then that stops the fibrogen, which we'll get into later, to binding to it. So then you can't get the fibrogen plate. So you don't, we don't see that many of these types of medicine in community pharmacy, but that's also another mechanism of where they can work. So the glycoprotein 2B and 3A inhibitors, um, so they inhibit here this receptor. Now here, this is the coagulation pathway. Um, so this is essentially made up of two different pathways that then come together to form the common pathway. So we've got the intrinsic pathway, um, which happens uh, as a result of damage that occurs inside the vascular system. So intrinsic in, inside, and the extrinsic pathway, which occurs as a result of external damage. Um, and basically these two pathways come together uh, to form the common pathway, which is this one here. So I've written it here, the common pathway, the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway meet. This is known as the common pathway and involves factors one, two, uh, five, and 10. So here, just to simplify it, I've got the different medicines working on the different parts of these pathways. Uh, so I've got here the factor 10A inhibitors. So they directly inhibit here once it's come to the common pathway. Uh, so they selectively inhibit factor 10A blocking thrombin production. So if we block factor 10A, um, we of course can no longer get thrombin. Uh, and then, so they block thrombin production conversion of fibrogen to fibrin. Uh, so that would then stop fibrogen to fibrin and thrombus development. So thrombus, as we remember, is the clot. So that's that bit there. So if we block that, then we uh, inhibit all this bit down in the cascade. Now we've also got warfarin. So warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. This inhibits synthesis of vitamin K dependent clotting factor two, seven, nine, and 10, and the antithrombotic factors, protein C and protein S. So here I've denoted warfarin with this purple pill here. And then they're basically showing all these clotting factors that are happening in the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, uh, clotting cascade and then because these clotting factors require vitamin K uh, to be synthesized then if we use warfarin then it will inhibit here as well so if we inhibit earlier along the path then we essentially inhibit the development of the clot as well so here uh, we've got uh, heparin so they basically uh, so they inactivate clotting factors 2a and XA by binding to antithrombin. Uh, so basically what happens here, so I use the green symbol because this is actually activating it. So they bind to antithrombin, which is already occurring in the body, and then antithrombin will then bind to thrombin, um, which then inhibits this. And then finally, we've got direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, so they reversibly inhibit both free fibrin bound thrombin, um, so that's, here, free, free fibrin brown thrombin. Um, so they prevent the conversion of fibrogen to fibrin. Uh, so they prevent the conversion of fibrogen to fibrin, um, and thus preventing thrombus formation. Um, so the thrombin-induced platelet aggregation is also inhibited. So obviously if we inhibit all those things down the pathway. Um, we prevent the thrombin-induced platelet aggregation. So where the uh, platelet aggregation and the um, and the fibrin come together. 
So I've linked them all directly to the medicine. So I hope that makes it a bit easier for you to remember. So basically we've got, um, I call them no clot medicines just to simplify it. So they're your antithrombotic drugs, which are made up of antiplatelets. Um, so they prevent platelets from clumping. This prevents clots from forming and growing. So examples there, your glycoprotein 2B and 3A inhibitors, your P2Y12 antagonists, your aspirin, your diapyridamol. Um, and then you have your anticoagulants. So they reduce fibrin formation by inhibiting specific pathways of the coagulation cascade. Um, this prevents the clot from forming and growing. Um, so examples of that were the heparins, the direct thrombin inhibitors, the factor 10A inhibitors, and the warfarin. So why do we need antiplatelets and anticoagulants since essentially one of them stops the formation of the clot? Um, and can we ever be on both? So knowing what you know now from what I've explained, um, would you be able to answer this? Let's see, if we go into a bit more details, um, and you can find all these slides in my first uh, Instagram post, the anti-clot medicines made easy. Uh, so basically platelets, so that part of the clot, that's an important part of clots that form in the arteries. Uh, so an easy way to think about what arteries do. So arteries take oxygenated blood from the heart to the body. So in the heart, the blood gets oxygenated with, um, and then it's pumping it to other parts of the body. So if you think the brain is at the very top of your body and the heart is in the middle, Think of arteries and that A symbol is making essentially an arrow. So it's pumping uh, the oxygenated blood away from the heart into the rest of the body so the rest of the body can get oxygen. Uh, and then just an important, so you gotta think um, platelets uh, are what are important factors in the clots that form an artery. So that's just a mnemonic plate art um, is an easy kind of way to remember what occurs in um, the arteries. Um, and obviously fibrin is part of those clots as well, but platelets uh, is the important component when clots are being formed in the arteries. Now, fibrin is an important component of clots that form in the veins. Um, so you can remember that by fibrin veins, I've kind of highlighted that bit there. Um, so if you got to think about what type of clots are forming in the veins, um, think they're the fibrin kind of ones so an easy way to kind of remember what veins do, so veins take deoxygenated blood from the body back to the heart. So you think veins is like an arrow as well, but it's pointing down. So a brain is at the top of the body and then a heart in the middle. Um, so the arrow is pointing down here. So it's taking the blood that no longer has the oxygen back into the heart to get the oxygen. So as we established, so a thrombus equals a blood clot. So this blood clot can occur in the artery, and then this would be your platelet, um, essentially blood clot. Um, and then that can result in an atrial thrombo, uh, thromboembolism. So that's your heart attack, so clot in the heart, and your ischemic stroke, so there your clot in your brain. And the, this blood clot, so this thrombus, can essentially happen in the veins as well. So, uh, so that results in venous thrombosis embolism. Um, aka VTE. Um, so that can be a DVT, so a clot in your deep vein, um, or a pulmonary embolism, so that's a clot in your lung. Uh, now there are other things that can cause like heart attacks, it's not just, it's not just a clot, but this is um, uh, slides are referring to when, uh, are referring to when clots are being formed and causing these. So um, as we established, so platelets are important components of clots that form in the arteries. So that's why we use antiplatelets for people that are at risk of heart attacks and ischemic strokes. And veins, uh, fibrin are important components of clots that form in the veins. So that's why we use anticoagulants um, in people at risk of DVT. So people that go on flights, for example, that you'll give them anticoagulants generally instead of aspirin because the clots that are forming in the veins, the deep veins, uh, these are your fibrin type clots. So fibrin is an important component of clots that form in the veins. And then now knowing this, that we are essentially getting clots that can be uh, important in the arteries or the veins, so one being made up of platelets and one being made up of fibrin, then you should know that uh, you essentially can be on 
both an antiplatelet and an anticoagulant. So I know sometimes some people, they might freak out if they see a patient both on clopidogrel and uh, like dabigatrin or clopidogrel and a factor 10A inhibitor at the same time, because they're just thinking that both of these medicines just cause uh, your body to bleed out. Um, but there can be clinical reasons for that as well, like if they're at risk of essentially both of them. So they call this triple therapy. So there's a few different triple therapies in medicine. So there's one for like when you get the stomach bug, um, H. pylori, um, but this is triple therapy when they're referring it to uh, people that are at risk of these cardiovascular disease. So triple therapy, a combination of oral anticoagulants plus dual antiplatelet therapy. So that's aspirin with a P2Y12 inhibitor has been used for patients with AF undergoing PCI in recent decades to reduce ischemic events under guideline recommendations. So this is a thing that already does kind of happen. Uh, it's You don't see it too commonly, but it does happen every now and then. You'll see it come into uh, someone come into community pharmacy that is on all three of these uh, anti-thrombotic medicines or no clot medicines as I call them. So back to the chart here. So I hope this explains it, uh, makes it a bit more simplified in terms of what I was trying to do here. So there's essentially two processes that are happening here. Oops, two processes that are happening here. So there's your platelet aggregation process. And then here is the Fribin, um, so the coagulation cascade. And then we're just combining the platelet aggregation um, with the Fribin to make the overall clot. So. Uh, the quote that I really liked, and that was from the first slide, so a complex system that works is invariably found to evolve from a simple system that works, and then is actually extended the thing. So a complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be made to work. So that's a kind of full um, part of that quote. So the purpose of this was just to try to simplify things as much as possible. We're just trying to get uh, this process instead of um, knowing all these crazy different pathways that are happening, if we can try to simplify it. So one being, uh, like I said, at the, near the very beginning, all we kind of need is for the, uh, the platelets and the fribin to come together to make a clot. So that's our first kind of simple process. So uh, fribin plus platelet equals clot. And then you can kind of simplify that down further. Like how does the platelet gets formed and where can we stop the platelet from getting formed? And then how does fribin get formed and where can we stop that from getting formed? All right, guys, I hope you found that very useful. Um, be sure to check out memorizemedicine.com if you need to study a whole range of different medicines. Um, and then check out my book, um, Surpassing the Pharmacy Australia into an Oral Exam. And there's one also out there for the written exam as well. I've got a range of videos that cover a few past year exams and just study tips as well. So check those out if you'd like to purchase them. I uh, appreciate those. All sales go towards helping making memorize medicine free and the development of the website. All right, guys, I will see you in the next video. Bye.